and this is an extreme sort of situation of this problem, but this is uh, this is something that occurs or it has the potential of occurring in a lot of different places around the country. I am Reese Tisdale, and this is The Future of Water, in which we talk about all the ways which companies, people, and utilities are addressing the challenges and opportunities in water. This is episode 80, a special episode at that, because we're doing it a little bit early and because there's some news. But in any case, I think it's going to be a good one. Today, I'm joined by Bluefield Senior Research Director, Greg Goodwin, to talk about what is seemingly a slow motion car crash in New Orleans, Louisiana, and surrounding areas regarding its water supply. I thought I'd just pull it up. I mean, I was just reading the news and is written by Jake Biddle at Grist. But I'd read this out paragraph he wrote that I thought sort of told the story. For the past month, as water level on the lower Mississippi River sinks lower amid extreme drought stretching from Nebraska to Ohio, a mass of salt water has been pushing up river from the Gulf of Mexico towards New Orleans filling the space where fresh water should be. Salt water is heavier than fresh water, so water forms the shape of a wedge pressing against the bottom of the river. The wedge is already slithered more than 50 miles upstream. This wedge is forecast to reach the intakes of New Orleans Algiers plant around October 22nd, the city's main Carrollton plant on October 28th, and East Jefferson on October 29th. President Biden has declared the situation a national emergency. He did that, I think, last week. So it's not a secret at that, at the federal levels of government, but also if contaminated, it could be weeks or months before fresh water returns, unless there's significant rainfall. So say the leaders of New Orleans and surrounding areas, once again, so you're going to get tired of hearing me say this, and you're going to get tired of hearing me quote Canadian hydrologist, James Bruce, if climate change is the shark, water is the teeth. In fact, I just drafted a Bluefield blog on climate change or what the marketing team told me not to say, but guess what? I'm on this podcast and I get to say it now. Who are going to be the winners of climate change? Truth be told, we're all losers, but some companies are going to emerge as champions uh, in adapting to what is coming in the aftermath of higher global temperatures and uh, water is going to play a big part of that. So uh, be on the lookout for that blog post, but also be on the lookout in just a minute after a couple comments about where you can meet Bluefield Research and before I bring in uh, Greg Goodwin. So before we get into it, like I said, I want to let you know where you can meet us. Lots of places. I got six places you can meet us over the next, I'd say, month, a month, and a couple of days. We're going to be at Bentley's Going Digital Awards in Infrastructure in Singapore from October 11th to 12th. Someone from Bluefield will be there. Be on the lookout. World Water Tech in Los Angeles, October 25th and 26th. I will be there. So if you want to meet with me, give me a shout out. The Oil Field Water Conference in Houston on November 2nd. Talk a little bit about the energy sector and water usage. Uh, we will be presenting there. And then uh, Xylem Reach in Orlando on November 5th to 8th, where we will be presenting there as well. Aquatech Amsterdam, November 6th to 9th, big conference in Europe number of people from Bluefield will be there. Also, we will have a booth, so be on the lookout for that. And lastly, Rockwell Automation Fair, November 6th to 9th. I and a couple of colleagues will be presenting at that, and that will be in Boston, just down the street, so an easy one. So the hits keep coming, so don't miss the opportunity to hang out with me and my colleagues. If you're interested in doing so, talking to Bluefield's team of water experts, give us a shout out. What are experts at bluefieldresearch.com? We do answer those emails. We check it all the time. Uh, that's the main link. So a lot of people see it. Let us know. All right. With that being said, let's get into conversation with Greg Goodwin to hear about what his thoughts are on New Orleans and beyond. All right. So I'm joined here by Greg Goodwin. Greg, what's going on? It's Friday, long weekend too. What do you got going on this weekend? Uh, not too much. It's, um, you know, it's October. It's uh, one of the best months in Boston, if you ask me, in terms of weather-wise. So hopefully the rain holds off a little bit, at least for part of the weekend. What about yourself? I am headed south, going to Western North Carolina to be with my family, um, which I'm super excited about. So I'm actually going to be out for the better part of the week. So it'll be a good one. So I'm not going to lie. I'm kind of psyched to get out of here. But while we do that, while we relax and do our things, 
if you're living in New Orleans, it's a little bit of a different story. Uh, New Orleans is about to run out of water, but not necessarily because there is no water, um, directly speaking. It's a little bit different than, let's say, what we've seen in Cape Town in the past or maybe even Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, you've done a fair amount of work uh, with the Water Reuse Association on forecasting reuse drivers, markets, not only in the Western U.S., but across the country. But one of the big areas, or uh, I guess you addressed one of these questions that was posed to us, honestly, by by a company was, when is the wave of water reuse and management going to shift from you know the Western U.S., where there's obvious drought concerns, Colorado River concerns, to the East? east of the Mississippi, let's say. Well, we've it's been happening, quite honestly. It's just the drivers in some respects and the impacts. Uh, it's a little more, it's a little different than just uh, purely precipitation driven. And one uh, impact of, of this and driver is another way to put it, is saltwater intrusion. So New Orleans has put the term saltwater intrusion in the... Uh, lexicon of every newspaper in the country. So why don't we talk a little bit about one, what is happening in New Orleans, and then we can get into like, what is salt water intrusion? So same question, but maybe try to break it up a little bit. Let's talk New Orleans, Greg, help us out. Sure. So essentially what's happening is the flow rate of the Mississippi River right now is low enough that there's essentially a wedge of salt water coming up from the Gulf of Mexico that's snaking its way up the river as we speak right now. And it's driven by a lack of precipitation primarily in the upper basin of the Mississippi. So that's why the water levels are low enough. And essentially when there's a certain concentration of salt water in what are primarily freshwater supplies that are used for drinking water, you get to a certain point that's pretty low percentage where that water is no longer usable. So Essentially, some communities on the very end of southeast Louisiana are now experiencing this problem where the water that they traditionally use for drinking water is now, at least temporarily, it's it's not usable for drinking water. So they have to find ways around, um, you know, using from their primary sources. So it's not the first time that this has ever happened. Um, they faced a similar threat in 1988, but it's the worst since then. And so... Uh, you know, there's, there's currently about 1.2 million people that are impacted by this, but, you know, people are thinking about uh, New Orleans in, in sort of, um, you know, as we sort of watch this, this wedge slowly make its way up, uh, the, the forecast for when this would occur around the New Orleans area is around, you know, between two and three weeks. Um, the intakes for New Orleans Algiers plant, it's expected to get there around October 22nd, so you know, we're talking less than around two weeks for that. And then the city's main Carrollton plant around October 28th, and then East Jefferson the following day. So, um, you know, when that happens, if there's not, you know, it, it it's going to be a lot of drinking of bottled water and sort of, there's sort of a scramble right now, basically by uh, planners and so forth of what to do. So, um, that's kind of the, the general issue that's facing right now. And um, again, it's something that hasn't happened on this scale in you know, a good 35 years. Yeah. I mean, what's in- interesting, scary, all of the above is that, um, you know, is an outsider, right? You know, we do have employees here at Bluefield that are from New Orleans. And I asked them the other day, one person in particular said, what are you more concerned about hurricanes or like a, a saltwater wedge coming your way? It's like an a- alien invasion. It is. It's it's almost like a you see the map of it on a on news sites, and it sort of looks like a horror movie type of thing um, in the way that it sort of manifests. And I think the saltwater wedge was more concerning to this one person in particular. It was like, really, like a hurricane doesn't scare you? It's like, yeah, you know, no, this is more concerning. I mean, there, I mean, the New Orleans area. We're looking at close to 1.2 million people that are potentially impacted. So I think you know, and we can get into solutions in a minute. But there are two things happening. They're starting to barge water in, for one. So barging water supplies into a city um, and communities in the surrounding area. So that's not sustainable. Um, So that's one thing they're doing. The other is there's been a proposal to build a pipeline of 100, what, 150, $250 million that is 
not an ins- insignificant chunk of change, but how sustainable is that? There's, and we can get into climate disasters and, and emergency events that have already happened. We're way past the historical $8.1 billion events every year. I think we're already at 23 this year. So, but let's talk a little bit about, you know, so those are two solutions, should I say, but let's get into that in a minute in greater detail, maybe, but the saltwater intrusion, you you alluded to like, and it's not just New Orleans, but it's happening partly because of the drought, but what other factors are influencing this? Sure. So, I mean, in the case of New Orleans, I mean, obviously we have a you know very low lying city that's near the ocean. So there's, this is a particular case where in normal times, the, you know, the flow of the river is such that it will push that water back out to the Gulf of Mexico. It's just, you know, right now that that situation is not occurring. Um, in other areas though, you know, there's, there's a couple of sort of competing factors that make this an issue. So there's, there's population uh, growth and demand on water supplies. So abstracting more water than is sustainable for a particular source, you know, that could be an aquifer, it could be uh, surface water in this particular case. There's climate that's, uh, you know, particularly occurring in this particular case. Uh, you know, what really needs to happen is a, a, a fair amount of rain, basically, in the upper Mississippi area to sort of flush all this salt water out. Um, you know, I know the forecasts, they, I think one of the sort of uh, meteorologists around this was saying they need about 10 inches of rain to solve this problem up further up the river. And there's, you know, one maybe inch that's forecast for the next week or two. So not looking, you know, super rosy in terms of that kind of natural remediation, if you will. But essentially, you know, there's since salt water is more dense than fresh water, when there are areas where there's one floating, particularly right on top of the other, if you get to a certain ratio, uh, you start pulling up the salt water. And then if that's going to be water used for potable, you know, uses, then it it becomes uh, non-usable, essentially. And this is an extreme sort of situation of this problem, but this is uh, this is something that occurs or it has the potential of occurring in a lot of different places around the country. So, um, you know, there's some, there was a study, I think a couple of years ago, a, a sort of a, a multi-year study of wells for uh, groundwater, drinking water that's, uh, you know, within 10 kilometers of, of, the, of the ocean. And, uh, you know, something like 30% of them have what's called a landward hydraulic gradient. So essentially that means that the, the level that the water is at is lower than sea level. So when you start getting to that area, depending on what is in between you and the sea, it raises the specter of saltwater intrusion dramatically when you get to that point. And obviously that water is used for a lot of different sources beyond drinking water, depending on where you are. But I mean... You know, this is a problem in Florida. It's a problem in places like Savannah, Georgia, Virginia Beach, Miami, Chesapeake Bay, even into like South New Jersey, up into, you know, we're in Boston and there's places on the Cape that are sort of dealing with this. So um, it's definitely not just a Gulf of Mexico sort of area uh, problem. It's, 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 it's along a lot of the coastal areas of the U.S. Yeah. I mean, so I, that was going to be my next question for you. I mean, so I'll sort of you sort of got a little bit ahead of me there. And I think that is like New York, Long Island, like that's a big issue right now. One, just population uh, overdrawing local aquifers, whether it be for golf courses, whether it be for lawns, whether it be just to meet community, commercial and residential needs. It's a big issue um, that I know the Department of Environmental Protection is definitely concerned about. But I think, you know, more broadly speaking, I mean, so just trying to pull now i definitely don't have these numbers in front of me but i've been looking more recently at like what percentage of the world's population lives within like 75 miles of coastal areas it's not insignificant it's actually i think is it it's in fact the majority look at the us specifically i mean i think we're on track you may have a better idea than i that 70 percent of the us population soon enough will live within 15 states most of which are on the coasts right so that's where the populations are irrespective of you know what why when and how that's just where everybody's going with few exceptions so it's creating a a real problem and for that reason you know florida 
know, everybody looks at California and said, oh, reuse is huge. Well, Florida actually is historically has been well ahead of, of places like California and the Western U.S. states with things like reuse because because of this exact issue. They, you know, limestone subsurface, uh, incredibly permeable, uh, high population demand. Who doesn't want to live in Florida? Keep any comments to yourself. And uh, and the highest point in the state is like, what, 60 feet above sea level or something? It's probably higher than that. But I mean, it's extremely low lying for where most people live. Yeah, exactly. So I think I, you know, as a result, I was looking at, you know, our pipeline of, of reuse projects in the US. So we've got is it a pipe? You know, we've got there in our data, we've got 1,032 to be exact projects. Uh, when I was looking at our data dashboard on reuse, and of that, I think 22% of that is in Florida, right? Much of that is either planned or already operational. But then also, like you mentioned, Virginia, what's happening, I think it's like Hampton Roads is another. Hampton, Virginia, we're seeing a lot of. Uh, Salt water intrusion or concerns there as well. And, you know, I think for let's maybe the next question I have for you is jump into solutions. Aside from sort of anticipating like a water world experience with Kevin Costner and growing, growing uh, gills and living like fish, um, what, what are some of the solutions that we're talking about? So kind of at the temporary level. So then one of the things that they're doing in some of these smaller communities and um, southeastern Louisiana is bringing in mobile, uh, essentially uh, reverse osmosis units. So RO can obviously be used to desalinate water. Uh, one of its main uses sort of on the municipal side. So that that's kind of a, a temporary stopgap that's uh, occurring in southeast uh, Louisiana right now, but that's not really you know, a scalable or sort of long-term solution that's, that's viable. So that's one thing kind of to do for emergency management there. And there's, you know, a number of companies that are involved in that space and it's kind of growing. So, you know, you have your Evoquas, Fluences, uh, Axines of the world and so forth. More of a long-term solution around that. I mean, we've, we've been talking about reuse. So there's a big drive to when you have sort of these potable sources that you're concerned about saltwater intrusion to be only using them basically for potable um, applications. So for on-site reuse on an industrial capacity, that's an, a big a big driver of, um, or, or saltwater intrusion is a big driver of, you know, those types of uh, systems. You know, centralized reuse at, at sort of the more uh, utility level is another, uh, you know, a long-term investment to try to basically limit what's being taken from sources where yeah, saltwater intrusion is basically a concern. So, um, again, this is a, a long-term um, issue to address, but uh, those are some of the, the ways that are, are occurring. And then there's also, you know, large-scale desal, which we do see, you know, San Diego um, growing, obviously, in, in a lot of places like in the Middle East, where long-term water supplies are a huge concern. And they're just sort of seeing the writing on the wall that, you know, in 30 years, we're not going to have drinking water here. So there's huge investments in massive plants. Um, you know, places like Saudi Arabia, Morocco, and um, places kind of dotting the Mediterranean and North Africa and so forth. But that, we definitely are going to see um, a large jump in, in that sort of investment in the next, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. And then you mentioned it before, the barge sort of uh, stopgap that they're using in New Orleans is, is sort of a specific application since they're on a huge river to sort of be able to kind of use what's there. But I mean, that's, you know, that's a bandaid on a, on a head wound that's basically occurring right now and, and definitely not a, a long-term situa uh, situation. Yeah. I mean, I think at the end of the day, you know, one of the things we, we look at and we talk about is, you know, it kind of, one, it depends on where you are. You, you mentioned the Middle East, obviously they truly water scarce, you know, not even water stressed. They're sort of next level, right? So the question is, is are places like Arizona, California heading in that direction? Ultimately, um, in some respects, you could say yes. If you've lived in Phoenix, like I have, it's the desert. Um, and there are a lot of people there and there's not enough water anymore. But neither here nor there. I think the point is like the cost of water, right? You know, desal, there's seawater everywhere. It's expensive. People do not want to pay for seawater. But although we've seen places like San Diego take steps, Australia take steps 
building at Desal. It's a bit of an insurance policy that supplies there, uh, whether you're using it all the time or not. It just happens to be, you know, in, in there's environmental pushback uh, in some cases. So next level down would be sort of reuse, right? Reuse is you're already treating wastewater in some respects. In many cases, two potable standards. So why isn't it being reused? Now, the question remains, I had a conversation yesterday with a number of different people, utility service providers and some engineering companies, and we we're talking about exactly that. You know, maybe potable reuse is actually a bridge too far, right? All it takes is one major screw up and then you've got real problems. So why not use indirect, just recharge aquifers, take that approach. It can be argued either way. I'm not picking a side here, but those are two solutions, reuse, desal, centralized and or decentralized that are the technologies exist, whether it be RO or a combination of different solutions and technologies. I am excited about, excited, uh, that's a scary way to put it, uh, but about mobile treatment, you know, temporary emergency systems. And we've seen companies like Sauer out of France or, or Niehaus, their subsidiary that they bought, buying up uh, mobile treatment solutions providers, particularly in Europe. Because honestly, uh, I re I've released a blog post, I think it went out today on our site that talks about, you know, um, who, which types of companies are going to emerge from climate change, you know, sort of the winners and losers, so to speak. I talked a little bit about one segment, engineering companies, actually. Um, I don't want to call them winners because there are no winners. But truth be told, um, you know, I think is as I think about sort of the responsiveness and the number of storm events and emergencies such as New Orleans, temporary treatment, you know, containerized solutions, that should be a market opportunity going forward for a number of players. The hard part is scaling, anticipating, being at the ready uh, to do so. So it's pretty interesting. Um, I mean, when it comes back to New Orleans, Greg, um, anything else to add sort of broadly speaking about, you know, saltwater intrusion and what to expect going forward? I think, you know, beyond the fact that they need rain <laughs> uh, further up the river, um, you know, it, it's a tough situation that they're facing. Obviously, there's huge costs associated with any of these sort of temporary measures and you can go ahead and say it climate change is coming to a town near you um yeah, well, yeah. i mean that's that's that i think that's a fair point um yeah but no i mean i just we hope for rain obviously in the upper mississippi and there's a lot of difficult choices to make in terms of uh you know where water's going to come from if that doesn't happen well with that being said i know this was sort of a, a quick fire drill on our end actually uh, for a number of reasons. So let's just sort of wrap it up with you. Why? What else uh, are you working on these days, uh, whether it be research or consulting wise? So, you know, there's a lot of happening in terms of um, M&A. So a lot of institutional investor uh, interest in specific types of companies, um, you know, moving towards service-based models, things like that, uh, modular solutions for, say, you know, um, pollutants like PFAS and other sort of things that are coming down the regulatory pipe. So it's a lot of inquiry around what's happening in that space. And, uh, you know, we're working to kind of figure it out for folks. Nice. Well, I know you're particularly busy. Like you said, I know, you know, you primarily work on the consulting side of our business, but uh, obviously have a lot of uh, knowledge and, and influence on the research side. Um, so appreciate that. Appreciate the time. You know, I know we, we tried actually to do this yesterday, but ran into other infrastructure technical difficulties, meaning uh, not so good internet. But hey, that's life. So thanks again, Greg, and uh, we will talk again soon. Thanks, Reese. Enjoy that pulled pork. Ah, cheers. Thanks. All right. That was awesome having Greg on. Um, you know, like I said, super knowledgeable, knows a lot about a lot of what we do across the board because he does work on consulting. So he's talking to a lot of different companies of all shapes, sizes, and types, US and globally, um, when it comes to water, municipal and industrial. So super helpful. And like I said, the the research we did for water reuse, I knew some of it's actually on water reuse's website. We did some regional profiles, which I think are pretty interesting. Um, East Coast 
think we did one sort of regional profile on the mid-Atlantic, which I do believe gets into things like saltwater intrusion uh, and what's happening. So we've talked about this plenty of times before. So if you're interested in that, you can go to Water Reuse's website. Maybe you could find those. I don't know if you actually, if you have to be a member or not, but also if you're interested, you can also just reach out to us for any information and insights on saltwater intrusion, water stress, water quality, and potential solutions and who's doing it. So before we sign off, if you're in Boston, Barcelona, Chicago, or any of those events I talked about at the top of the podcast, let us know. We'd like to meet you. Water experts at bluefieldresearch.com. Let us know. Please subscribe. Give us a review. It is really helpful. Our numbers continue to climb episode after episode. So those responses or that feedback we get from Apple and all the other podcast uh, service providers or platforms are giving us uh, some idea that people are interested. So thanks for uh, doing that. But the reviews do help. Send us a note if you have any topic ideas you'd like us to discuss. Uh, we're doing this for you or we're just happy to chat, quite honestly. Uh, there, you know, everybody has good insights and good uh, questions. So as they say in school, there's no bad question. Uh, lastly, tell a friend about this podcast so we can spread the wealth. This podcast and these water industry insights have been brought to you by the one and only Bluefield Research. To learn more about us, visit us at bluefieldresearch.com. Until we talk again, be well, be safe, and take care. <laughs>